We're gonna live. We're gonna hit the live stream, Sarah. Okay. All right. Cool. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, I am Jennifer McFadden. I'm Associate Director of Entrepreneurial Programs here at the School of Management. I also teach a class, Founders Practicum, which has School of Management and joint degree students working on ventures for credit. Um, we started this organization, we at Yale, about a year ago, Cass Walker Harvey, who will be coming from a meeting and will be in in a few minutes. And I, too, support women and femme identifying individuals from across campus. We have wonderful partners like Kate. Hathaway, who's coming from Women in Tech. Um, and what we try to do is a series of events throughout the year that really try to bring people from across campus together who are looking to either launch ventures or projects. Um, so today we have Sarah Bickerstaff, who is a faculty member here at the School of Management. She teaches a leadership class, which is incredible and very well regarded by the student population. And I have heard that this particular session that she is going to do is incredibly impactful. And so uh -oh. hopefully all of you will find value in it. We are also super excited to have a guy in the room because frankly, that sometimes helps you understand how it feels to be us sometimes when we're yeah. full of men. So bravo for you for coming. And we welcome anybody from across campus regardless of who they are. So. With that, I will pass it on to you. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to dive right in because we have we have 50 minutes to talk about something that we could talk about for an entire semester. Um, and I will say to those of you who are who are joining us virtually, um, a, a lot of the a lot of the discussions in the classroom or in the in the class today, um, I, I would ask just can have that have that conversation with yourself and there are questions that I'll pose and it can be really helpful to actually write things out so some of the some of the partner exercises that are in the room can actually be journal exercises for for those of you who are um, who aren't in the room um, and this topic of, of giving and receiving feedback, I, um, as was mentioned, I teach a, a course at SOM called Leadership Lab, and students in, in that course are identifying development goals that are important to them, leadership development goals that are a really high priority for them. And these are people who are coming from a variety of backgrounds and countries and working in different sectors and different kinds of organizations who have different goals, professional goals and expectations. And, and I bet 20% of the time, across that huge segment of, of students who are SOM students and Greater Yale students, the primary development goal that they pick is feedback. Asking for feedback, better receiving feedback, more effectively giving feedback, and that might be developmental feedback or it might be giving strengths-based feedback, but it's a trend that I see time and time again. So kudos to you all for being here because I really, I think this is a lifetime practice um, and it's incredibly challenging, um, I think, to, to get really, um, sort of sophisticated the practice of, of giving feedback because we don't often think about it as a practice. It's an event or an exchange, and so today we'll talk about ways that you can think about making it a, a practice in, in hopefully um, your, your lives. So to dive in, actually let's really quickly, I would love to hear what makes, in your experience, what has made feedback really effective? What's made it good? And I will give the disclaimer that I will stand in silence. So just know. Yeah? When people give real life examples of what I've done and how I can change that behavior or model differently. Yes, real examples. It's not vague. And we're gonna talk about like we're gonna talk about vague feedback, but real examples of, of what happened. Yeah. Yes, there is, there is safety in the regularity of it. Then it doesn't become a high stakes, high emotional event. Oh, this is what we do here. Every three months, every six months we have feedback and, and maybe in between that, it's easier to have conversations about the feedback rather than who's been somewhere. Maybe for, for those of you who are um, you know, college students in a, on a team or in an internship and those who are, who are, um, who are a little more seasoned, we've had feedback once a year and you knew it was coming and there's gonna be a piece of paper that assessed you with the feedback. That's the worst, it's not helpful at all. Um, and luckily a lot of organizations are moving away from that, but a lot are still, still sticking with it. So hopefully all of you will go out and change those organizations when you get the chance. Um, yeah. Thinking along the lines of setting up a situation where the feedback is asked for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, planting the seed, doing some preparation, helping helping someone that you want to give you feedback be able to give you good feedback. Yep, love it. And what about on the flip side? Hallmarks of ineffective feedback. If you've experienced 
possibly anything like that in your lives. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and to pull that thread, I imagine that's not highlighting a strength that is bad to do publicly, but more on the, the developmental side. Yes, definitely, and that's the quickest way, if there's trust in that relationship, to say, boop, gone now, don't have it anymore. What else? Yeah. We're going to talk about that. I'm just going to dive in. I gave him five dollars to say that, so uh, remind me to give you <laughs> give you the cash. Um, okay, so diving diving in. What I think can be really helpful is to think about what can you do wherever you are, whatever um, whatever your world is, to create a feedback culture, and that includes having safety and trust around giving it. That comes from normalizing it, where it's regular. It's not something that is so unexpected, where you know, oh, we do this here. Also, where there's balance. Um, there's balance between receiving developmental or constructive feedback and appreciative feedback. Who knows what the, 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 the ratios vary a little bit, um, but the ratio between, for someone to feel like they're receiving balanced feedback, the ratio of appreciative feedback to constructive or developmental. Any guesses? Five to one. For someone to feel like they receive balanced feedback, about five times more strength-based feedback than developmental. And the reason for that is, where's our, our psychologist? Our brains are, no, you're an economist? Genetics. Why might that be? For it to feel balanced, that we need that much more appreciative or positive feedback. Yeah, yeah, that normalcy won't be there, and we're primed to remember the negative. One of my favorite quotes is our brains are like Teflon for the positive and Velcro for the negative. Who's gotten a report card, all A's, and there was a B? You're like, oh, where did all of your attention go? It went to the B, not the, wow, seven A's. This is really great, but it fixate, we, fix, we fixate on the negative. So thinking about the importance of that, when we're giving feedback, it doesn't always need to be balanced, but for overall, for it to feel balanced, we need to highlight a lot more strengths. And then 360, meaning that it's not just that feedback goes from the top down in organizations, so that we can give feedback to colleagues, and that managers can ask people on their teams for feedback and get it, and, and give feedback up. So this is what creates a feedback culture, and that comes from asking for it and giving it. So today, I wanna to share a little bit of feedback research that I think is incredibly interesting, um, do a little exercise around asking for and receiving feedback, and then some prep work around giving feedback as well. Um, so very much a, a hands-on practice today where you'll have a little bit of time to, to do each of those two, the asking, prepping for feedback that you might ask for, and then feedback that, that you might give. And hopefully you'll go out and do it. Um, so feedback research, this is something that came out of Gallup a couple of years ago. Um, the focus here is on, on millennials, and one thing I'll just highlight is this point that only 19% of millennials who were surveyed said that they receive routine feedback. So to your point that it's routine and regular, one out of five people are actually receiving that. And that number doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. Um, and then 17% say that feedback is actually meaningful. So that's pretty, those are pretty low numbers. What I see there is a huge opportunity. It's an opportunity to give more feedback and to give better feedback. And that comes through, it comes through practice and through doing some of the things that we'll talk about today. Now here is my hands down favorite um, bit of research on feedback. And it comes out of um, Stacy Blake Beard's work. And she does a lot of, a, a, a lot of research around mentorship um, and mentorship and development and uh, leadership development with regard to um, race and gender in particular. And what she finds is that developmental feedback can be hard for a manager to give. We know that that's, that's like, yeah, we, we know that, we can get that. It can be difficult to give developmental feedback. Um, and that might be a manager, it might be a coach, it might be someone in an authority position. It can be especially uncomfortable when it's given across a dimension of difference. And a dimension of difference meaning difference from the person who has the feedback to give. So that might mean, uh, a dimension of difference might be uh, age, it might be race, it might be gender. 
And organizations, when there are, let's say, a, a significant percentage of, of leadership in organizations might be Caucasian men, that dimension of difference might be anything that's not a Caucasian man. Um, and so what happens, what, what she's found in her work is that when there is that dimension of difference, um, the, the managers have, may have the unconscious tendency to hold back. She uses this term protective hesitation, and it goes like this. I have some feedback for you, Unco but I'm not, I'm not thinking that I'm, I'm doing this, but I have some feedback. Oh, but you're younger than me, and I don't know how you're gonna take it. So yeah, like what if you do something that makes me feel uncomfortable, or you feel uncomfortable? So instead of giving you that feedback, I'm just not gonna do it. It's the protective hesitation. And I love the word play on it, because in my mind, who am I protecting? Who am I actually protecting, though? Myself, as the, as the leader. So who feels like at some point, maybe you've experienced some protective hesitation, where you thought there was feedback there, but somebody just, they weren't saying something to you because you felt that you, they weren't sure how you might respond, and you think, maybe this has something to do with something I have no control over, my age, my race, my gender. Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing some nods, and this is something that I see pretty, pretty regularly. So I love this idea of protective hesitation. Well, I don't love it. I actually don't like it at all. Um, but I love to just have it in mind. So thinking that you might, if you're asking someone for feedback and you're not getting anything from them, this could be in play. And so then, then you're informed. You think, okay, this might, this might be a case where there is protective hesitation going on. What can I do to overcome that barrier? Um, and then the last, the last piece of, of research that I'll mention, this comes out of Stanford, and this was looking at um, uh, tech, women in tech. And what they found was that performance reviews in this, in this tech company um, showed that women, and this is for positive feedback, appreciative feedback, um, that, that women had vague positive responses in their performance reviews more than men. The men were more likely to have, uh, have positive comments that were tied to business results. And the women were more likely to get vague feedback in their performance review. You did a great job. Keep doing what you're doing. Fantastic quarter. We really value you here. Where the men were more likely to get feedback that was tied to great job bringing in X amount of dollars, or you launched the app two months pro you know, two months ahead of schedule, and that allowed us to bring in this, this revenue. So when that happens, what they then found, they kind of pulled the thread a little bit and found that um, when, when women had more vague feedback in their performance reviews, they were less likely to get promoted. They, were, they weren't getting bonuses in the same way that the, that the men were. Um, and, and that's because vague feedback for a woman in her performance review was tied to a lower performance evaluation overall. When, and then for the men, when they had vague feedback, it actually didn't even impact them negatively. So women are more likely to get it and are more likely to be negative, negatively impacted from it. And again, this is just a little, a little thing to keep in mind and to keep with you, that vague feedback, you know, as a, a person giving feedback, you can think, oh, I gave some feedback. I told someone, like, oh, good job, you know, keep, keep that up. It's not helpful. It's really, really not helpful. And in some, and, and depending on what your, what your role is when you're giving that feedback, it, it can actually be really limiting. So it's incredibly important, as one of you said, to be really specific and to ground in examples. And so we're gonna get into talking about how to do that. But I noticed that I'm talking fast and trying to fit a lot in. I'll take it a, a breath and a pause, but any, any thoughts on this research or, or questions here? All right, we move on. Two types of feedback. Um, the language that I, I'll get on my soapbox a little bit. Uh, the language that I think is really, really effective to use is appreciative and developmental. Appreciative feedback and developmental feedback. And developmental feedback can address gaps, but it can also address strengths. So let's say I've identified, you're on my team, and we've highlighted that you had this really important strength that's contributing positively to the, to the team's effectiveness. So maybe developmental feedback is how do you leverage that even more? Or how do you use it in a, in a, a different project that we're working on? So developmental feedback can be looking at a gap, something you wanna do better, or, or a strength. I beg of you. Say bye to positive and negative. I've said positive a little bit because I hadn't grounded us in this appreciative language yet. Um, but what's the problem with positive and negative when we're thinking about feedback? Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's, it's very binary, absolutely. What else? What if I said, I have some negative feedback for you. What happens inside? <gasps> when we are receiving feedback, we wanna be as open as we possibly can. We wanna be receptive, we wanna be able to listen. When we say, I have some negative feedback for you, automatically it's a criticism. It's a something that you're doing wrong versus an opportunity to grow or develop. And some of you in the room, and I see this in my students, there's always a, a, a portion who are thinking, I love when somebody says they have negative feedback from me. If that's you, great. If you thrive on it, great. But the people who work with you and for you, they don't feel that way. Uh, so yeah, remember that. If you love, you say, oh, negative feedback really, it makes me it feel really driven, great. But the people who are around you probably don't feel that way. So just consider the language change. Um, take it outside of yourself a little bit. So bye-bye positive and negative, hello appreciative and developmental. And really the, the important one there is a the developmental because the mindset there is I'm giving feedback to help someone grow and develop as opposed to negative, which is to potentially, maybe the mindset is I want you to grow and develop, but the language of negative feedback can come across as a criticism. Okay. So, asking and receiving feedback. Um, what are some barriers that you've noticed to asking for feedback? Barriers to asking. Yeah? Oh, can you say a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm gonna open up a whole can of worms, and I don't want that can of worms. Yep, yeah, in the, in the too busy culture, oh, I'm gonna ask for feedback, and my, my manager always tell me how busy she is, so now it's one more thing, and now I feel guilty about it, so I'm not gonna ask. What else, anything else? Yeah, absolutely. What's the right setting? What's gonna feel comfortable? Um, maybe, you know, and, and I, this is a, one of the, the many challenges with open space offices. There are no doors. There's nowhere to go. And if you live in Connecticut between pretty much November and April, you're not going outside for a walk. Uh, so yeah, that setting is really key. And some of the things I hear really often, I don't know how, I do ask and I don't get it. The giver isn't approachable, there isn't time, I might disagree with it, I might be criticized, there could be negative consequences. What if, I, what if everything was going fine and then I asked for feedback and all of a sudden there are negative consequences associated with it? Or maybe I get terrible feedback that I don't agree with and now the person assumes that I'm gonna take that feedback. So thinking about asking for feedback I love using some, uh, some little models and frameworks on, on the giving side, but for asking, um, it gets really to the $5 that I paid to our one gentleman here. Thinking about creating a conversation versus a, versus a transaction. How can we think about asking for feedback by creating a conversation, being in dialogue, which we do all of the time, um, and do quite effectively, versus a transaction of, I'm going to ask you for feedback, you're gonna give it to me, and then I'm gonna go away. And that can feel really stilted and uncomfortable because it is. I mean, that's an, that's a, an overplay right there. Um, but thinking about what can we do to make it a conversation. Some really helpful things, I think. What do we do in conversations? We ask questions, and we ask different kinds of questions. Maybe based on what I wanna know about or what I wanna ask, I ask specific questions, or maybe I ask, ask more open-ended exploratory questions. Speaking the language of the person you're asking. What is, other than literally speaking the language that the person you're asking speaks, what does it mean to speak the language of the person you're asking? Yeah? I would call it focus. Um, it's basically kind of contextualizing to the person. Yeah. And um, formats. Yeah, so if I am working with or for someone and I'm not getting feedback that, I, that I'm asking for that I really want or need for them, how do I adapt the way that I'm engaging in, in that conversation with them to help them help me? Um, I find it really helpful if you only remember one thing, just don't say feedback. 
who has asked someone for feedback before and you saw their eyes get really big? And they said, no, it's good, everything's fine, everything's good. And we, think, we make this assumption that the people, often the people we're asking for feedback are in more senior positions. So we had this idea of, well, they should be really comfortable with it. They're more senior than me. They've done this a lot. It shouldn't be an issue for them. Don't, if you start finding yourself believing that, that is a wrong assumption. Um, so sometimes if you notice that the person that you're, that you're talking with or that, you're, that you want to get the feedback from is not receptive to that word, can you share some thoughts with me? Hey, what did you think about? Knowing for yourself that that's feedback, you don't have to use that language for them. Um, thinking about timing, um, you know, the, thinking about the method of asking. So some, again, this goes back to who, who is my audience? Is it, am I asking someone for feedback uh, who really wants to have a private conversation or, or, or really values privacy, and I've asked them in an open setting repeatedly, and I'm not getting what I need from them, so maybe I need to send an email, and we set a private time to talk, or I ask for the feedback over email. All of these are very simple ways to just say, think about your audience, and think about what you can do to adapt your ask to help the person. The biggest assumption I see people hold is that when we're asking for feedback, um, we assume that it's easy for the other person to give it, because we're in the mode of receiving. Just don't assume that. Very often, and this is, this, it's a goal I see time and time again to get better at giving feedback, particularly developmental or constructive feedback. Um, so being thoughtful about, hmm, what can I do to make this a conversation with someone to help them tell me some things about myself or my performance or how I'm engaging with others that's just beneficial to me? Um, and taking away that, that lens of feedback. Questions, thoughts, hot tips here, things that you've done that have been really helpful. Yeah, yeah, so I, um, I see a couple of familiar faces. I am obsessed with what questions, and what questions are questions that begin with what, um, and what would that look like? What really worked there? What's holding you back? Any question that begins with what, and I, I, I like what over why. What evokes exploration, why evokes explanation, and so using open-ended what questions is a great way to have those kinds of conversations. And then when you ask those what questions, you can, you can drill down in, into the details, but it can be a really nice way to have a broader, a broader conversation. And I'll share, um, I'll share the, 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 the materials for to, from today with, with, uh, with Cass, and she can send them out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'll add a list of my favorite what questions as well. Um, there's like 150 what questions. They're great. Um, okay, so I want you all to get, your, to get your hands into this really quickly, receiving feedback. You can take a look, um, a, a look at this when, um, you know, when, you, when, you get the, when you get the slides, but the, the real thing here, here, here for me in receiving feedback is if we're asking for feedback and we want to get it a second, third, fourth time, how we receive it is incredibly important. And so noticing, do I ask for feedback? And then when someone starts to give it to me, I automatically start to disagree with it or explain it. Or do I shut down? Or um, do I ag overly agree with feedback that I shouldn't overly agree with? So I think, you know, thinking about how can I be open and listen? How can, I, you know, if I'm confused or I have questions, ask for clarification, repeat what I heard, um, but really just saying thank you and letting, letting it be that. And when you're giving someone feedback, if they're listening, they have a couple questions and then say, they say thank you, consider that a success because sometimes we need, to, we need to process what we're hearing. And that can be if it's a strengths or developmental. For some people, it's much harder to hear strengths-based feedback than, than developmental. Um, so really paying attention to how you're receiving feedback and knowing that if you ask, and you respond in a way um, that is off-putting to the other person, they're just less likely to give, it, to give it to you the next time. So being really conscious of that. Um, now I want you to get, get into the practice of, of asking. And so you can do, if you're sitting next to someone, groups of twos or threes, just think about some feedback that you are curious about, someone that you'd like to get feedback from or a situation you'd like to get some feedback on. Just think about that, who could you ask um, really, if you only think about one thing, what are the barriers to asking? And those might be internal barriers, they might be external barriers, and then how can you overcome those barriers? So we're only gonna take a few minutes here, but it's really, really helpful to talk through a plan like this with, a, with another person. And that's a, 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 a little bit of a, maybe a hot tip I'll share. Spending a few minutes talking through something like this with a colleague 
or a friend or a family member helps you hear what it is that you're saying and play around with it. And then you can be, um, you can be more effective in the ask when you do it. So we spend a lot of time thinking about asking for feedback sometimes, but not much time practicing asking for feedback. And I love to switch that. Less time thinking about it and more time actually playing around and practicing it in advance of, of doing it. Not forever, but more time than none. Um, so take just three or four minutes here with the person next to you and think about some feedback that you'd like to ask for, for yourself, and we'll, and we'll check in on it. And if you're not sitting next to someone, just kind of mi migrate. And take a, a few seconds here to wrap up. <laughs> All right, let's press pause here. And check in a little bit. Um, who, let's see, uh, who identified a, a barrier, either internal, external barrier or barriers that you noticed in, in the feedback that you want to ask for? He just tried to volunteer you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so like the, the a hierarchical structure, absolutely, yeah. Because usually in that, you know, it's, it, the, it just rolls down, and it's okay to give feedback down, but it's, it's hard to ask and certainly difficult to give up or across. Yep. Other barriers. Well, how do you, so how do you, what do you do to overcome that a little bit? You can't change the structure, so what do you do to overcome that barrier? Still working on it. Keep up with them. Keep having the conversation. 
Um, okay, so asking for feedback, I want to put a little bit of a bow on that and, and, go, to, and go to giving. Um, what I find that is that it's, um, you know, people have different preferences. Some think it's, it's easier to ask, some, some think it's easier, easier to give. For those who ask for feedback really well and receive it really well, it creates this really positive feedback loop um, where then people are more likely to offer it and more likely to ask for it. So the more that you can effectively ask for it and receive it, and then maybe take action on it, you certainly don't need to act on all feedback, but acting on feedback in a way that lets the person know, hey, I heard you, and this is, this is what I'm doing with it, starts to create that environment where then they think, oh, maybe I could ask for a little feedback too, and that's what creates a feedback culture. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge um, management consultant approved initiative. It can really start with people on the ground doing these small things and modeling this behavior for others. Okay, so let's look a little bit at giving, giving feedback for the next 15, 20 minutes. Um, barriers to giving feedback. What are some of the barriers that you've experienced in giving feedback? Things that keep you from doing it or make you not want to. Yes. Will this hurt the relationship? Will the person become upset? What other other things? Yeah. Not having a mutual respect to be received is that you don't feel like you need to be heard. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Any other barriers? Yeah. Maybe it just brings you back and forth and makes it more contentious for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's the, what's, I've already given this feedback five times. The person's not doing anything with it. I'm not going to give this again. Yep. Um, I, I hear I don't know how. It's intimidating. I don't want to cause conflict, damage the relationship. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to cause more harm than good. And that might look like I've, already, I've done this multiple times, or we already have a tenuous relationship here. Do I really give this feedback? Because it might, it might damage the relationship even more. Or no one around here gives it. If I'm the one giving feedback, then I stand out and I look like different than everyone else because in this organization or in this culture or in this group or team, we just don't do that. So significant barriers often to giving, to giving feedback. Um, I like to think about three things in the process of giving. And this is where I do, I do like to ground in some frameworks. Um, and thinking about three things, and we'll hit on each of these. And the first one is the highest good. I'll talk about that. Generating the feedback using a two by two. It wouldn't be uh, a talk in a business school if there weren't a two by two. Um, so we're going to have our requisite two by two. Don't worry. Um, and then an acronym called COIN. So envisioning the highest good. When I'm, when I, uh, one of the things that I find to be really helpful in giving, thinking about feedback to give, whether someone has asked me for it or I have feedback that I want to give to a person, envisioning the, them at their best in the role they're in or envisioning their strengths, seeing, thinking about where they're really at their best. It does a couple of things. One, it can ground me in the reality of where that person is right now. Um, if their best is here, like at their best they're in this place, and I have these expectations that are over here, that to me is a point to start to reflect, okay, am I, you know, am, am I seeing the person as they are or am I seeing them how, they, how I want them to be? But more importantly, envisioning someone thinking about the highest good puts me in a, a point of being appreciative and respectful. Appreciative and respectful. And when we can give feedback, developmental feedback in particular, from a place of appreciation and respect, then it's far more likely to be received. It's far more likely to be received as someone can really tell, like, oh, they have my best interest. They're actually thinking about me in a way um, that's, that's valuable and important to me. So it's just a little mental exercise. Who, how have I seen this teammate of mine at their best? Mental exercise as I'm thinking about generating the feedback. And then our two by two. Yes. I have a question on that. Mm. Um, what is their best perceived by them is different than their best perceived by you? That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Do you often preface, in my opinion, I think that you are not performing at your highest level? What will you preface? In my opinion? Let's, we'll talk about the, the framing. Um, and I, I, that's, that I'm glad that you asked that. I actually don't usually, I don't share the highest, like the, the highest good. It's, it's for me. It's in it's the process of the giver. Someone's asked me for feedback or I have feedback that I need to share. It's a mental exercise I do for myself to sort of frame like, who, what do, what do I really value about this person? Where are they? And now, what's the feedback that I'm, that I'm generating? 
Then, I, and this is a, some of you might think, oh, this could take forever. You get, it, it doesn't, but it does take more, it, it does take a couple of minutes. Um, I find this to be a, a nice little mental exercise to do if you're giving feedback on a team. When you're leading a team, this I absolutely love. So, impact on results, low to high, ease of change. Is it hard to easy? So, feedback. Am I, have, am I thinking about feedback that, you know, and if I have feedback already in my mind, maybe I'll plot it. Where is it? Does it fall in the high difficult category? Uh, the impact on the results is really high, but it's really hard to change. So maybe I give this feedback, and we'll talk about what that would look like, but I don't need to give a lot of this feedback. Um, and research shows, in particular, when people are starting new projects or learning something new, a common misconception we have is that more feedback is better in those situations. It's associated with lower performance, to get a lot of feedback early on, and that affect has a huge role in it. So if someone's going through a challenging time, you notice that they're emotionally down, they're feeling, um, maybe they're, they're feeling low or depressed, they have less capacity for receiving, any, for receiving feedback. And so just being aware of that and saying, huh, do I give a lot of feedback that's, that's up here in the high difficult? That might be a lot for a person to take. So I want to be judicious about that. Or uh, is it high impact and easy? Maybe this is good initial feedback. This can be feedback that can build trust, mo uh, mo momentum for the person, um, confidence for them. And then feedback that's hard to change and low impact. What, is, what are the things that fall into this category? The nitpicky stuff that drives us crazy about other people. Doesn't matter, hard for the person to change, and that can be where we spend a lot of time on the feedback. So I think it's a, it's a responsibility of the giver to say, oh, ooh, to say, am I, is this, is this hard for the person to change and doesn't have a huge impact? Maybe I don't give that feedback. All feedback does not need to be given. And then of course, um, low, low impact on results and easy to modify. And thinking like, could this be helpful? Is this a good way to integrate giving feedback or is this just gonna be a distraction for the person? So I, I need to stay away from it. So just thinking about the feedback that I wanna give for someone, where might it fall? And have, have I given a lot of feedback here? Now if you're, if you're leading a team, one of the things I love as an exercise is to give a, an empty, you could give this, this matrix actually, I've you know, done, done this before, um, a, a, a matrix in Excel that looks just like this to your team. Each person on the team, fill this out. The feedback that I've given you in the past year, fill, fill it in. Where the, the feedback that I've given you, show me where you would plot it. And I see amazing things. I've seen leaders get back a stack of blank papers. Oh, wow. That's feedback. I've seen leaders get back a stack where almost everything is in high difficult. And they notice, oh, I've had a lot of turnover in the past year. I wonder if that has something to do with it. Or where it's any version of unbalanced. And really what you want, as a, as a leader, you want people to be receiving feedback that's balanced. Things that are stretches and really challenging high impact things that are easier for them to modify, but this is a great conversation starter. Hey, fill this in, or um, using it on a, on, on a team where maybe it's a, uh, there are um, your, your peers and colleagues and you're working on a project together. So lots of different ways to play with this, but a nice way to think about is the feedback that I'm giving, where does, where does it fall and is it worth giving, or the feedback that I wanna give? Questions or thoughts here? Okay. And then, if you, were, if you take one thing from today around giving feedback, the, the, um, the acronym COIN, in giving feedback, and a couple of you have, have mentioned um, elements of, of this already. So giving feedback using context, observation, impact, and next steps. And what that looks like, C is for context, finding common ground and linking it back to the feedback situation. So that might look like, we talked, uh, we talked about your goal to be a project team leader. We've done this before. So let's go over your leadership of the team's progress meeting last week. We're, we're grounding the conversation. Grounding the conversation. Observations, and this is really important. I think, I think you said this. Um, describing behaviors. Describing behaviors, specific and factual. What a, game, what a video camera would show. 
Now, if I had the, if, if my phone was out and I was recording it, what would it actually show rather than my assessment of what you did? So that might look like, in my mind, you were really ticked off in that meeting. So maybe I give the feedback, my observation is you were really ticked off, or my observation is what would the, what would the camera show? The camera would show that you pushed away from the table and you walked out in the middle of our conversation. You want to be really clearly grounded in the observation. And why is that? You're not reflecting judgment. You're saying what happened. And this gets really complicated when we're working cross-culturally, when we're working in a lot of different ways. So I'll give, I'll give an example uh, that, that I saw years ago in a, a meeting I was in. There was a, a colleague of mine who was sitting next to me, and she was, through the, through the meeting, kind of had her arms crossed. <clears throat> and um, this is when HR was still telling people you should pay attention, like read body language. Um, in, in meetings, and so another colleague said to her, Colleen, I see you're really, you're really upset, you're really angry today, and she was like, what? And, she, and he said, well, your arms are crossed, and when a person has crossed arms, that's a clear indicator that they're angry, and she said, I spilled coffee on my shirt, and I didn't want anyone to see that, and it's a silly example, but we make assumptions and pass judgment on those assumptions um, when they're often, they, they may be ungrounded. So a silly example, but noticing that we have ideas of why someone's doing something that are all our own. They may be accurate, they may not be. When you're giving, and that's a, for humans, we do this. When you're giving feedback though, you wanna stay away from the evaluation and stick to the observation. Stick to, because also you can go back and really, uh, the person's more likely to be able to connect to an action, a behavior, an observation, rather than your assessment of what they were thinking, feeling, or doing. So that might look like, in, the, uh, in this ongoing example, you made an agenda for the team's meeting last week, you allocated time for each item, and you sent it out well in advance. This is, these are things that we see actually happened. Eyes for impact. The impact on you, the project, the business. Um, thinking about keeping it results-based, remembering that that vague feedback holds, holds all people, but really holds women back. So um, not being vague. Impact, by having an agenda, so by doing the things that you did, so this is obviously, this is appreciative feedback. Um, it allowed, <coughs> excuse me, it allowed everyone on the team to share where they are and what they need help with. That hasn't happened in months. So this is a positive impact. Next steps, and depending on the situation, if you're leading the, per leading the team or the, this is your direct report, maybe you're gonna direct next steps. Um, or Maybe you're going to suggest next steps, or maybe you're, this is uh, feedback that you're sharing with, um, with your boss, and you're not going to direct next steps, or uh, a colleague, and it's a conversation. So next steps is going to look different based on the, the context of the relationship. Next step here, to build your confidence even more, I'd like you to present during our next meeting with the CFO. I know that's been my role. I think you're ready for it. So put together, and imagine, these are bullet points, but imagine there's a conversation. We talk. Let's compare this to feedback that might look like, great job the last couple of weeks. I really appreciate what you're doing. And that's, who's gotten feedback like that before? Great job. Yeah. Thinking, what, what exactly was the great job? So it's nice to hear, but it's not particularly helpful. What's probably really helpful is, we talked about your goal to be a project leader. Let's discuss it. Here's what you did, and here was the positive impact in doing it. Now here are the next steps. That's much more actionable and helpful feedback than, great job, I really love having you on this team. That's easy, that's lazy feedback to give. Um, so what's, what I think what's important is as a feedback giver, knowing that we can give lazy feedback and it's fine, it's just not gonna be very helpful. Uh, and the more that we can give thoughtful and well-developed feedback, the more impact it's gonna have and the more actionable it's going to be. Thoughts, questions here? Okay. Um, so I want you all to take, we won't do this whole thing, I'll, I'll put in the, in the stuff that I send to Cass, I'll, give, I'll send a worksheet that pretty much looks like this, but this to me, this is a giving feedback prep worksheet that I, I personally use and share with, share with a lot of people. You know, think what's the person's highest self in this role or in general, generating the feedback, where does it, where does it fall in the two by two, and then actually taking the time to think out What's the, the context, my observation, the impact, and next steps? 
Well, it's dialogue, it's a conversation, it's dynamic. You're not gonna read from a script, but doing the homework and having some things actually written out is really, really valuable. And what I hear time and again, and what I experience too, is that when people use a little structure in this way, it's greatly appreciated. Who wouldn't want the person that you work for to be thoughtful about the feedback that you give? So it takes a little time, but it's well worth it. And, and like any practice, the more you do it, the less you have to try. And it becomes second nature and more intuitive. So a little work on the front end and a huge impact on, on the back end. And not only are you giving feedback, maybe this is on a team. Maybe you're, you're working in a class and you have a project group and you can practice giving feedback there. But the more you do it, the more you do it well, the more you're modeling it for others and giving them examples. Um, and uh, the, the stories I love the most are when people come back to me and they say, oh, this person I had this really kind of tense and fraught relationship with, gave them this feedback and it, you know, I think it went as well as it could. And then a couple of months later, they'll, like, they'll mimic it back. And that's the best compliment you can have, to have someone sort of mimicking back in the way that you've given feedback. Not the same, but the same kind of way in which you're doing it. And that's that really nice, contagious effect that, that we want. So take a cup, well, no. No, we're not even, we're not gonna, we're not gonna press it. We're not gonna press it. Um, questions on giving feedback. Thoughts here. One of my favorite questions is how do you like to get feedback? And sometimes people, there don't, I mean, lots of times people don't want to ask that or, or don't ask. I love it. I love to know. If somebody says, oh, I really, and it doesn't mean you always get what you want, but I love to, I prefer written feedback. I like to be able to read something. I like, I, that's, I don't listen to podcasts, I don't do audiobooks, I do words, and I like to read my feedback. And when someone asks me, I always say it. And sometimes I get it and sometimes I don't. I just love the question. Also showing um, whether you're in a, a leadership position, position or not, to me that's, um, that's wonderful leadership. I'm being thoughtful about the person who I'm gonna give feedback to, and I'm thinking about how I can adapt it in a way that helps them receive it. That's a great question. Other questions? Okay. Ooh. Yes. It's hard. It's really hard. Just don't do it. No. <laughs> Chalk it up, lend <laughs> the friendship or quit the job. No, um, it's, it's really challenging. So who's, has anyone done, has anyone navigated this before? You've had uh, maybe a relationship where you were on a team or you worked with someone and you were, you were friends as well. And you, how did, how, can you share a little bit about, like maybe we'll start with, with you. How did, it, how did you do it well? I don't know if it was well. Okay, how did you do it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and so I think I, I think that's a really important element of navigating that tricky space is um, is is identifying even naming. I know we, we I know we're friends and we work together, and I have I have something I want to share that's more on the work side, and even naming I I also find I think it's um, helpful not always but often to say like, I actually feel a little uncomfortable with it because I value your friendship so much. 
And this is, you know, this, the, so even naming those things can, because we, know, we all know the other person's, it, it's an, it can be a really uncomfortable thing. But drawing that distinction, so what, what I do see, and this comes up a lot at SOM, as you can imagine, where everyone's on project teams together, and then everyone is going out together and having fun, and so you can't walk around this school without seeing a, a cocktail party, which is fun. But it, it, it can really blur those lines, and it makes feedback that much more challenging because the relationships are, are primarily friendships. And being able to draw that, that distinction and say, I know we're this and this, and this is something that's in this space. So, and I, and I, I love the, the hat, too. Yeah, Cass, what, what's, what's been your experience? Yeah. It's, it's, it's challenging, and I, I think you, I, I'm seeing like nodding, and I imagine that some of you who have experienced this inside, you're, you're kind of nodding as well, because if it, if it festers, then what starts to happen is, oh, now I don't want to hang out as much. And then the friendship is weird. And then the work relationship is weirder. And then it's a whole thing. And all of a sudden, it's this when it was really this. And so um, being thoughtful and intentional about it, I think, is, is a great way to start, and, then, and actually having it. And, and naming it, too. That's a really good question. Any other questions? OK, ooh, 5 o'clock. All right, so we are wrapping up. Um, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't leave without sharing maybe my favorite easy little feedback framework. Who's seen Stop, Start, Continue? All right, this is great. It's, you can't not remember it because it's three words, and they're words you all know. Um, I love this as a way. You can use this individually. You can use it on teams. Start, stop. What am I currently doing that if I were to stop would make me a better team member? What am I currently doing? So start. What am I currently doing that if I was to start? What am I not currently doing that if I was to start would make me even more effective, make me a better teammate, better colleague, whatever. And then continue. What am I currently doing that's really working? I'm asking because I want to keep doing it. So you can ask this in individually. You can share this. Um, maybe you have a, a feedback exchange that you, that you do with someone or with your team. And then the way that I see it used super effectively is if you're in a project group or a team together, as a team, <laughs> what are we currently doing that if we stopped, we'd be a better team? What are we currently doing if we started? We'd be a better team, and what should we keep doing? And then it's not attributed to any one person. It's, hey, let's look at ourselves as a team, and that's a really effective way to give team feedback, and also to see, oh, you think we should start doing that? I thought we should stop doing that. So it creates all of these great conversations. You know, it takes some, some trust and, um, and, and other elements and strength, strength of the team to have this, but a really, this is a low level entry point. It can be as low risk here as, as you want it to be. Okay, so wrapping up, da, 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 appreciative, developmental. I will get on my appreciative, uh, d appreciative feedback soapbox some other day, but I think we vastly undervalue it, and the more we can do it, the better. Um, and we often brush it aside, pay attention to it, um, and then the, to get more comfortable and better at giving feedback or creating a feedback culture, we need to ask for it, receive it well, and, and model giving it to others. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Apologies for the speed talking, but I'm a stickler for, for time. Um, and I will share, I'll share this stuff and feel free to use it, use it or not. And if you have any feedback questions, shoot me an email, sarah.biggerstaff. It'll be on the on the resources, and I'm happy to, to have those conversations too. Thank you all.